the goal of developing you is to take information, turn it into application for transformation. And I think that's the that's the treasure of being a, a disciple maker. That's the treasure of being a kingdom worker, that you just do good works and you don't take tally of all the things that you do. You just try to impact people's lives for the kingdom on a daily basis. So I'm like, you know, Dennis is sidekick when he needs one. Yeah, yeah, that's like having the Pope as your sidekick, right? It's, it's like that. All right, and I look forward to having Greg on Mornings with Carmen. There you go. Oh, I hope so. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I got him first. Supposedly, Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living. In the world of today's complex organizations, what does it take to max perform those? Well, it takes an examined life. I can't think of a better person to help us talk about that than Dr. Greg Campbell, the author of the new book, Developing You. This is a great conversation with Greg Campbell about what it means to have emotional intelligence, what it means to think about changing the social dynamics in your workplace. Join with co-host Carmen LaBerge for Mornings with Carmen. We are going to have a great deep dive on what it means to be a disciple who understands who we are in our workplace. Here we go. Dr. Greg Campbell, welcome to the Disciple Dilemma. We're delighted you're with us today. Woo, thank you so much, uh, Dennis, for having me on. I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. Thank you for having me. And Carmen, thanks for adding a lot of value to the stuff we do on the Disciple Dilemma. We're so glad you're here today. Thanks, Dennis. And I'm thrilled to be talking with Greg. He's one of my favorites, and I can just hardly wait to get my hands uh, on the book we're talking about today. You two have done this before on your show, right, Carmen? Well, actually, we've we've done this in real life in person at an event. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm still waiting for Greg to be on my show. So actually, you're ahead of me um, on that. But yeah, we know each other well. And I'm still downloading and processing that in-person session. That's that's how amazing it was to be with Carmen during that time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Greg Campbell, I've had the chance to be in person with you. I think you are a grandparent now. I am. I am. Two weeks ago, I had my first uh, grandson. His name is Amari. Uh, biblically, uh, it means grace. And in the African language, it means courage. So grace and courage. And he is the most beautiful gift that a grandparent could ever have. It's just been amazing. Are we going to be able to get you to focus today, man? Oh, I, you, now, you, now I have to refocus. That's the question. Can I refocus? <laughs> I want to talk about developing you, but the you not being you, the you being us, you just wrote a book coming out in April called Developing You, and I did, I want to lead off on this, and then Carmen can have second round on this one, and uh, we'll, we'll start having some fun working through it, but when I think about a title like Developing You, I could get narcissistic, but I know you don't mean it that way. How does modern Western culture conform us to think and develop in ways that your book is pushing back against? What are you trying to accomplish here? What we're experiencing, Dennis, right now as humans is that people are defining themselves and others through the lens of social media, television, what we're seeing from our leaders today, and what's called normal, I would say, isn't normal. So what's happening to our leaders? Because our purpose and our values come from our experience, our mentors, being with others. And what is that lens today? What does it look like? So I'm pushing back on that, saying that where does your purpose and values come from? It starts with you. And that's why I call the book Developing You. So as you as you do your work today, by the way, folks, you heard this in the intro, but this guy's a gunslinger for a lot of years. He's a law enforcement guy who has turned into a guy who's helping to improve organizations. And so what I think you're telling us is we have an obligation to be different than the culture. And you phrase that like a lens. So would you just 
clarify a little bit about some of the thematics that, on the bad side. What is the dark side of culture as we get ready to talk about the good side you want to take us into? What do you think about there? Here's what I would say to you. So I'm just a kid from Compton, California. I grew up in the inner city of Los Angeles and just a little clip, Dennis, Growing up as a kid in Compton, California in the 70s, when I grew up there, it was called the murder capital of the U.S. It's where the Crips and blood gangs actually started. When I was growing up, I didn't have one family member that had ever graduated from college. I had at least six family members serving 25 years in prison. That was my normal. That was the kids in my neighborhood's normal. And so from a young age, Dennis, I said, I don't want to be normal. I want to be abnormal. Greg, so when you talk about being um, out of place, yeah. um, part of the gift that you bring um, to people who have always, uh, they will have never felt out of place or outnumbered or unseen or sidelined, um, you are able to bring a perspective to those of us who maybe thought we'd never be outnumbered and now we are. Whether or not, um, you know, that's about being Christian or that's about being being white. Um, and so I do think that you God has given you such an incredible life experience. And I know that it didn't always feel like an incredible life experience, but all along the way, um, you've been cultivating this conversation. And so I feel like this book is a culmination of sorts. Um, because even when you talk about emotional intelligence or even when you talk about these um, 11 um, transformative practices, these are not new to you. Um, these are things that you've experienced along the way. So maybe talk a little bit about your journey of transformation and then lead us into a conversation about what's, um, you know, the practices, the toolkit that you unpack uh, in the book. What I'm hoping, I focus on emotional intelligence intentionally. So growing up where I grew up and in my initial uh, sort of leadership journey, I have 27 years of leadership, as Dennis said, in federal law enforcement. I, uh, Carmen, I call myself a pracademic. Let me explain what that means. I have 27 years of living um, and leading, living and leading in the marketplace. But I also have an academic background. I have a PhD in management. My research interests and expertise is in leadership and emotional intelligence. So I believe that emotional intelligence or developing you starts with the four core skills of emotional intelligence, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. I'll explain why those are important. So my journey started with, as a, as a young kid, again, as I stated earlier, recognizing very quick that normal isn't really normal or normal isn't what I want to be. That was in my environment, what I was surrounded by. And that was a, that was a microcosm. It was very small. It was Compton. And I didn't travel the world and get this picture. It was in that small. And so I learned at an early age, how do I take information? Then take that information and turn it into application or different behaviors that leads to transformation. So let me sum it up. The goal of developing you is to take information, turn it into application, for transformation. That's developing you. The problem that we're facing in society today is where are we getting the information? You talk every day on your show, what, all the stuff that is coming in from different places and our, 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 our lens of what we're taking into our, our, our hearts, our, our, the center, our hearts, and in our minds is just being distorted. And what naturally, I think, as humans, we want to do, we want to be like others. We don't want to feel out of place. It's uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable in Compton, California, being the only one in my kid group to say, I'm going to go to college. It was uncomfortable. Nobody talked about that. It was uncomfortable. I'm going to be the one to, to get out of the city. Nobody talked about that. So I had to, and I know this is sort of a common term, 
I had to lean into discomfort from a very young age. And I will tell you one, I think my greatest skills and what I'm trying to share with the readers is that leaning into discomfort takes practice. And the more you do it, the easier it's going to be. And in a time where normal isn't normal, you're going to have to lean into discomfort, which I would say is to lean into being abnormal. You know, folks, as I'm listening to him talk about this, this is Romans 12 screaming, do not be conformed, right? Come that's on, that's, that's popping up. So, so Greg has been living weird. He's been living weird compared to the culture. The culture is looking at him and going weird. We've got this whole idea that he's just listed four points, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, uh, responsibility, and then this, this Wait, whole relationship idea management of relationship management. And then, yeah. So. I'm I'm thinking about this. I'm going, how do I, as a follower of Christ, unpack without narcissism, self-awareness, social awareness, social responsibility? How, how do I do that, Greg? Because it sounds like you could be tempted to get into navel gazing here. What are you selling for the believer compared to what the world wants to sell in those phrases? I'm telling you, it's okay to start out with the man and the woman in the mirror. You can call that navel gazing. You can call, I'm saying it starts with looking in the mirror. Let me just give you a picture of that. What we're living in a time now is what we see in the mirror and what we see in the mirror, we generally lean into those things that we don't like, those things that, that we see that are different. And then we try to change those things. Um, what I want to say to individuals, as well as we are looking in that mirror, going deeper into what do I see? What do I see? Is to say there is a treasure in you. Don't just lean in to look into that mirror into your flaws, but do something a little different. Do something a little uncomfortable and find the treasure that is within you. The way that I like to see it, say it, and to help people see it in their minds, in their mind's eye, is that if you think of an apple seed, Everything that needs to produce the fruit on the tree is in the seed. Emotional intelligence. Back in my day, right? I'm male, I'm pale, I'm straight, and I'm very stale, right? So back in my day, running an organization... I didn't care about emotions. I just wanted to get the production numbers done. I didn't care about the way people felt. You're not talking about emotions the way the culture thinks about emotional intelligence. Unpack that one for us so we can go deep dive into what you're writing about. So people ask me all the time, Dennis and Carmen, who's your audience? Who are you talking to with emotional intelligence? And one of my colleagues, his name is Demias Perdue. He says it this way and he hits his heart he spent 22 years as a U.S. Marine. He said, the audience is anybody with a heartbeat. And then I take it one step further and I say, anybody with a brain. So anybody with a heartbeat, a heartbeat and a brain, this message is for you. So when I'm talking about emotional intelligence, Dennis, I mean, every single human being experiences emotions every single day. Matter of fact, um, the Cleveland Clinic said it this way. Every human being goes through about 60,000 thoughts in a day. Of those 60,000 thoughts, about 200 events are emotional or triggering events. The question that I have for your readers is, do they know how to rum, R-U-M, recognize, understand, and manage those emotions? You're going to have emotional events every day. I'm going to have them every day. What I'm trying to help readers and, and those who are listening to this podcast understand is how do you recognize, understand, and manage those emotions as they happen? Our first endorsement of rum on the disciple dilemma. <laughs> so, Greg, maybe talk about that a little bit. Talk about um, this in terms of leadership and when you use the phrasing of emotional intelligence and you're talking to Christians who are leaders how do we lead with emotional intelligence? Sure. I'm going to start with a, a common phrase that many leaders have heard. People don't leave organizations. They leave leaders. 
if we accept that as truth, then why are people leaving organizations? It's because of individual leaders' behaviors. So the question is, emotional intelligence is the foundation. I tell people this all the time. Care if you're a charismatic leader, a servant leader, a transformational leader, a situational leader, no matter what one of your leadership styles are. If they're not steep or the foundation of that leadership is not in emotional intelligence, those four skills, then you're missing something. Because first, you're not going to recognize your own emotions, Carmen. And then that's where the pain starts. That's where people leaving an organization starts to happen. Tony Evans said it this way. I love his, his sermon analogies. He says, and many of us have heard of Dr. Tony Evans. He says, I have an iPhone, but I've never... I've never sent an email or a text with my iPhone. And I'm sitting there listening to him and I'm saying, that's abnormal. That's weird. But if you don't use it, it does you no good. And so that's what I'm saying to every human being, every leader out there, that you are experiencing emotions. But if you don't know that you got the app, if you don't use it, then you're not tapping into what you need to tap into. And I believe that emotional intelligence is the app. Emotional intelligence is the answer when you can figure out your own emotions and then start to understand others' emotions and then start to build great relationships. I'll sum it up with this. Results move at the speed of relationships, but relationships move at the speed of trust. And that's the foundation of emotional intelligence. We are talking with Dr. Greg Campbell, his new book, Developing You, 11 Transformative Practices of Self-Development and Emotional Intelligence. And folks, when we come back, Greg's going to unpack all the secrets of the universe in that book. Stick with us. Folks, we're back with Dr. Greg Campbell. Carmen and I are exploring his work, brand new book coming out in April, Developing You, Unleashing the 11 Transformative Practices of Self-Development and Emotional Intelligence. So, Greg, one of the things that I love is that you give us an acronym, and yeah. the acronym is DEVELOPMENT. So the 11 transformative practices spell the word development. I'm wondering if you'll just give us a preview of those. So Carmen, thank you for asking that question. And just like rum, I love keeping things simple. And when I was a federal agent, I worked for the United States Postal Inspection Service. It's the oldest federal law enforcement agency. For those of you who are not familiar with it out there, Benjamin Franklin was actually the first postal inspector. But what I learned quickly about the postal service is they love acronyms. So I'm still postal blue on the inside. So you get an acronym in this book and it starts out, uh, it's called development. So Carmen, the D stands for develop your true potential. It starts there. And we've been talking about that this morning from the start. Where does it come from? Being uncomfortable, being um, abnormal, discovering your true potential. The E stands for enhancing your skills and knowledge. The V, valuing self-awareness and cultivating a growth mindset. Powerful. Oh, that's, an, that's one of my favorite chapters. And then empowering yourself with effective communication and relationship management. And then the L is leading with emotional intelligence and making better decisions. Our leaders need to understand how emotional intelligence directly impacts or improves your decision-making ability. The O stands for overcoming challenges and resilience and adaptability. And in today's culture, where you're going to be abnormal, I'm going to steal Dennis's word earlier, where you're going to be maybe even weird, then you need to overcome challenges. You're going to need the skills to be resilient or to bounce back and then to be adaptable. The P stands for prioritizing wellness um, and practicing self-care. Carmen, that's important to me because I like to say it this way, the absence of illness does not equal wellness. And what you have in the workplace is a lot of leaders with what I call invisible wounds. You can't see the scars, but they're hurting. And when they're hurting, they hurt others. So that chapter is 
is important and critical. The M stands for maximizing your potential for success and happiness. The E is embrace your values and purpose. The N is nurture meaningful relationships and work-life balance. And I know that can be a dirty word these days is work-life balance because there's five generations in the workforce right now. And some of us are from a generation that says, oh, I want a career or you work because you get a paycheck. Well, maybe we have a younger generation now that values their, their time and their balance in their life. And that's not a dirty word. It's not a bad thing. It's can companies adapt? That's the question. It's a wonderful chapter. The T says, take charge of your life and live with intention. People ask me all the time, how did I make it out of Compton, California? I lived with intention. And then last is the T, take charge of your, um, actually that's the last one, sorry, is take charge of your life and live with intention. And that's what I did um, throughout my younger years and while leading in government for 27 years. What in the world would you suggest for a disciple trying to grasp this idea of becoming emotionally intelligent? How do I take your development and begin to embrace this idea of emotional intelligence in the individuals I'm around? So first of all, I I believe, I'm going to use a, uh, we use the term discipleship. And as a young kid growing up in the Baptist church in Compton, California, our, our lenses are often shaped by others. Our lenses are shaped by our environments. And Carmen, I thought mission work in my neighborhood at my little local church where most of my family went, it was when we passed a basket around the church and when somebody couldn't pay their light bill or their gas bill, that's what mission work, what that, we called it the mission, the mission offering. And then when I was in my early 20s and became a federal agent, and moved to the Bay Area and was exposed, I'm going to use that word, to the teachings and discipleship of Dr. Samuel Huddleston, he taught me that missions, I was blown away because I'd never experienced it before, that mission work is, is kingdom work. It's going out. And from there, as his youth pastor, I took kids to Africa, Mexico, Costa Rica, and we 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 just loved God, we obeyed God, and we did what God asked us to do. And what he taught me, because I was also raised to believe that if you were going to be in ministry, then you quit your job in the marketplace and you own and you you work at the church. And he pulled me aside and he said, Young man, what do you do for a living? How much do you get paid? He said, mm -mm, you're not going to quit your job. He taught me that God needs disciples in the marketplace. And that's why I call it kingdom work. Every day I get up, I'm excited about going into the marketplace saying, God, how can you use me to touch somebody's life? that's coming to a place of work, whether it's in government, whether it's a doctor's office, whether it's a school teacher, that's where the mission field really is at. The church is where the people who believe often come to get to, get, to grow, <laughs> but we need to be going out to reach those that may never come into a church. And I think that's the time that we are in right now. It's abnormal. It's weird that we need to leave the church to go do real discipleship. Can I ask a follow-up question about being a Christian, let's say in federal government, like let's mm -hmm. use an example of a place where, a part of the marketplace where there are, it's not like there will be in the future um, things that are mandated of you as an employee or required of you or expectations at, that are contrary to your biblical or Christian worldview. It's not like we've got to wait around for that. Those already exist. So can you just address that? Talk to the person right now. They're 45 years old. They work in a in a government or government related job, maybe as a contractor. And there are things being asked of them or 
forced upon them that are contrary to their Christian or biblical worldview, but they do need to keep their job and do what they do. Yeah. Can you help us have a conversation about that? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for asking the question. So Carmen, I would say it this way. First, let me set the foundation. Let me give you the answer first, and then I'm going to give you an example. So emotional intelligence helps you to embrace your purpose and your values. Why is that important? Because if you're not careful, your values and your purpose will be shaped by others that are living what we now call normal. And what your goal should be is to be abnormal. Now, let me just give you some examples of what I mean, how to be a kingdom disciple in the workplace, doing what you do every day. I worked in government for 27 years. You can't just go in there talking about the Bible, you know, saying John 3, 16. So I would do things like this, Carmen. Here was my sort of my first motto uh, was witness at all times and use words only when necessary. What I mean by that is they were, my people were watching my behaviors. How was I living my life? What was coming out of my mouth? What was in my heart? Matter of fact, the book says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So there's some corrupt hearts out there. There's some hurting hearts out there. And there's some people that need heart transplants. And guess what? I'm the doctor without being in the hospital. And maybe the hospital is my government office building. And I begin to do surgery on the people in which I led and the people I which I served with by living my life in a godly way and letting them watch me live. Matter of fact, Carmen, I won't talk about the brain much, but this brain is a powerful thing. There's something called mirror neurons. And as you begin to let your behavior reflect one thing, the people who you lead and the people who are around you will mirror your behavior. The question is, leaders, what are they mirroring? So one thing that I'm getting out of this conversation is that we want to be self-aware and there's a progressive structure that takes us on through social awareness and responsibilities. And that that's beautiful. I love that because that is the life of the disciple to first understand our bankrupt state and our progressive sanctification. We want to get that, but you're going deeper than this. I think Greg, and I, I just like to give you the chance to respond to this. You're telling us in a way that comes through powerfully to me, your work in developing you the book is telling me I need to learn how to use emotional intelligence to come aboard with another person's life to understand them and then to invite them to come along on my weird life. Am I, am I getting in the ballpark with what you're talking about? Absolutely. And I actually use the word intentionally. Every time I talk to corporations, people, I intentionally use the word, I want to invite you. I extend an invitation. Because we're living in a time where if you're a believer, if you're a disciple, if you're a kingdom worker, you could be discouraged because it's lonely these days. The travelers are few, even in the workplace. As a matter of fact, I, I love the scripture, um, Proverbs 13, 12. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. And we are living in a time right now where you are, people, Christians are losing hope because it seems like so few of us in the marketplace are actually doing kingdom work. I was just going to make the observation that the book title doesn't like suggest or reveal that this is a Christian having conversations with Christians. And I like yeah. that. Um, and I just wanted to give Greg an opportunity to say something about that if he wanted to. Carmen, I love you because I love the way you ask questions. And so when I think about this book, the reason, Carmen, I wrestled. I love that question because I wrestled with this. I actually even called my mentor, Dr. Sam Huddleston, and I said, I have a dilemma. Dennis, I said, I have a dilemma. I said, I'm a Christian, I'm a kingdom worker, and I'm struggling with not making this book totally biblically based and putting scriptures in. 
And he walked me through it. He said, what have you done for 27 years? He said, you witnessed at all times and you use words, scriptures when necessary. So Carmen, can I give you a couple of examples? I would stand up in front of government officials. I would stand up at U.S. attorney press conference. I had the opportunity to be at the White House and in front of important people. And I would say something like this. One of my favorite books says, so a man thinketh, so is he. I would say things without actually quoting the scripture, but I would tell stories from the book. And what I would like to say, what I what I said to people and what my goal was, is that I would always think of, I'm going to open the book, I'm going to learn some of the things in the book, and then I'm going to become the book. And that's what I invite our leaders to do. That's what I feel this book does, is I didn't need to put a whole lot of scriptures in there. It's almost like a parable. Those who, who needed to get it, you're going to get it when you read this book. And then those who needed to receive it in another way that's more palatable to them, they're going to receive it as well. And then probably the most important thing in the book for me is I'm not a, uh, even though I believe self-awareness is important, I don't believe you stop there. It's not enough to just be aware. You got to take information, turn it into application for transformation. The goal is transformation. So after each chapter, I have these, th these areas called, so what, now what? Now that you've identified the issue, the challenge, what you see, now what are you going to do? And I call that, so what, now what? That's turning information into application for transformation. So, Dr. Campbell, my sources tell me that when you left your role as a law enforcement guy, you got a lot of performance reports on a bunch of three by five cards. Give us the dirt. We want to hear it all. Oh, my goodness. You know, again, I'm going to go back to that quote and restate it. People don't leave organizations. They leave leaders. The question is, what kind of leader are you? And one of the things that I did when I retired, and I read it in one some leadership book, and it recommended rather than having a big grand retirement party, and when I retired, I was second in charge of the whole country as a federal agent. So not to impress you, but to impress upon you what, what the span of leadership that I had responsibility for. And so I decided, let me just try this. And I, I told across the whole country, all the people that I managed, I said, rather than send me all kinds of different things, just take a three by five card and put something on that card in which I've impacted your life or something that I may have said or done that it may have touched your life. Matter of fact, Maya Angelo says it this way. It sums up what I've asked them to do. She said, people may forget what you say. They may forget what you do, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. So I asked people to put that on a card for me. And I got hundreds of cards from around the country. And that was one of those, those moments in my life that changed the trajectory of my life because I was like, wow, I didn't know that I actually had did all the things that I had did. And I think that's the, that's the treasure of being a, a disciple maker. That's the treasure of being a kingdom worker that you just do good works and you don't take tally of all the things that you do. You just try to impact people's lives for the kingdom on a daily basis. This week, I had the opportunity, uh, just yesterday, actually, I had an opportunity to go into a prison in West Virginia. It's the, it's the highest maximum security prison in West Virginia, and it's one of the only of its kind on the East Coast. And we've been training inmates, those who they call themselves justice impacted, uh, in Florida, Mississippi, and West Virginia. And all of these students have went through a Bible college. Don't miss this. They went through a Bible college initially. And then we brought in a component of emotional intelligence to go with the Bible. And we had a chance to interview 15 individuals at Mount Olive Prison in West Virginia on yesterday. And when I tell you it has changed my life, it was unbelievable. There was story after story of how the Bible saved them, 
trans turn, you know, turned turned their lives around. But emotional intelligence gave them the tools to walk it out on a daily basis. Greg, it's been so great to um, to be with you today uh, to preview the book. Um, how can people find it? I think it's available already for pre-orders. And then how can folks get in touch with you? Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have provided the website. Um, you can get the book on bookbaby.com today, and then it'll be available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and all the other websites for pre-order um, here coming up soon. And it will be available on April 5th. You can reach me at G Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L -L, at G-C-J Enterprises. Dot com. That's G Campbell at GCJ Enterprises.com. And then I'm working, the book is just hot off the press. So I'm working on my new website. It should be up this weekend and it, it will be called www.developingyou.co.co. So www.developingyou.co. Greg Campbell, the author of Developing You. Good luck with the book launch. We're prayerful for the book launch, and we're thankful for you being with us today on The Disciple Dilemma. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Carmen LaBerge, thank you for hanging out with us today. You can catch Carmen, Mornings with Carmen, on Faith Radio, and you can also creep her website, CarmenLaBerge.com. That's L-A-B-E-R-G-E.com. All right, and I look forward to having Greg on Mornings with Carmen. There you go. Oh, I hope so. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I got him first. Would you help the church think more about discipleship? Would you help us get the conversation started to talk about the biblical discipleship Jesus gave us? Please follow us. Our website, www.thediscipledilemma.com. You can find us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and all the RSS feeds. If you'd follow or like us, you'll help us get leverage in the digital marketplace to talk about the fact that discipleship needs to be talked about. And as always, folks, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.